For those of you who are not used to the congregation, please don't look at your watch because I don't preach long. <laughs> but for those of you not used to the life of the congregation um, that want to look at your watch, you can go right ahead and look because I am going to preach until I'm done. <laughs> Because I think that there is a kind of raising up that is necessary. You raise me up, and that's important. But it's amazing that God might raise us up. That God might take the broken likes of this part of his family and let it become banner, beacon, help, contribution to what's going on out there. What's going on here, there and everywhere. Look with me, if you will, at the back of the bulletin, if you want to watch the scripture as it's read. If you're the kind of person that prefers just to listen, that's okay too. From 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16, uh, 6 through 13. We're not looking for praise from men and women, not from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we should have been a burden to you, but... We were gentle among you like a mother caring for her children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. And that's because you become, had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toils and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. And you were witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each one of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a word just of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in all of you who believe. May God bless that and give us hearts to understand it. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. 11 years old. One member of a new family being formed. We have terms for such things. Blended family. New family. Family following divorce. The little girl goes back to school on the first Monday after the weekend and begins to talk to a friend and says, we're working at being a family and we're going to work hard at it and each of us is responsible for the outcome. 11 years old. There's a sense in which God has called us to be a part of the family of God. You and I this us called Wells and those of you who visit, the family of God. A family that loves one another, that forgives one another. A family that laughs together, a family that feels free to cry. Tonight I preach about lament and praise. And one of the things that causes the church to lack authenticity, I think, is that we're very quick to talk about victory and praise but slow to talk about defeat and lament. It's all a part of the life of our family and as a curious family, unique family. This particular part of us needs to be careful always to be appropriate and how we love one another and to be sure that it's vested in the grace of God which allows us to be and to be together anyway. So as a part of God's family, we need to recognize that some of us will function in the role of mother. The mother who gives nurture, nourishment. The mother who can be present. Not necessarily the older women of the church, because often some of our younger people are called into a role of mother. And every now and then, some of we guys are called into the role of mother, too, as present, creative, nurture giver. Someone said the other, way, the other day that there would probably be a lot more peace on earth if men could also have babies. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. But I think there's a certain sense in which the link between suffering and new life needs to be examined. And a mother is willing to suffer for the good of those that she loves. Some of us are ready for milk. Some of us are ready for a little salad. And some of us, according to what the scripture says, are ready to move on to the weightier issues of the law. A little meat, if you will. Sometimes I run into people who say, I'm not going to be going to church there because I'm not being fed. Hey, the meaning of the church is that we feed each other. And if you haven't been fed this day, what a lovely thing to come to a banquet feast of spirit so that in songs and prayers and checks given and people hugged and people loved and people received and a place being made for some of us who never really felt that there was a place for us. Our family life declares there's a place for you. And sometimes we need to be loved like mothers and sometimes like fathers. I love the way the scripture puts it. It puts it so well when it says, you know, like a father who encourages and comforts and gives direction. What value is contained in being able to say to another person, to me, You are a significant person. Or if that's not the way you talk, hey, I'm glad you came. I mean that. You see, it's all about grace anyway. Every single piece of what we are and every single piece of what we might become trying to make family is a matter of grace. From time to time, I like to tell tales about graduate school. A professor I had who was a German guy, Manfred Hoffman. He's the one that called me Dot Little Tinkle instead of Tonkel. <laughs> Mr. Tinkle. Very high class academic intellectual type. So you can imagine what happens one day when he comes in and says, I look at you and I think that this is some kind of a conglomeration. This mess of men and women. And then I look at you again and I see you becoming one. Something new. Something never dreamed of before. At least not Until it happens, I see you becoming family. And this, in spite of everything, family. Well, we need that kind of encouragement. And we also need from time to time to have a little comfort from people in authority. The scripture says, treat the older women as mothers, the older men as fathers, and the younger people as brothers and sisters, and with regard to sisters, nothing more. (laughs) Excuse me. With all discretion, it says, be appropriate. And you know, when I read that, I thought, you know, the older people of our church ought to be treating people like that. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, honey, you are the older people. You're one of them. You're one of the fathers. Not the only one, but one. It's funny because our outward person changes, but our inward person sort of at least looks to us in similar fashion. I mean, it must change and it must grow too for us to be true sons and daughters of God. It's not static reality, but living, thriving, growing, changing. But it's funny because the outward changes so quickly. Some of you know this story, and I'm going to give you the revised version without the bad language, but uh, it wasn't bad. But When Mom first went out to Wells' house, we had put a mirror up in the little room where she stayed. Wish she could go back, but anyway, one day we were out for the Wednesday lunch, which is it's really a great event. I hope you all will come. But we went to pick her up, and she was standing there looking at the mirror, fixing her little hair. And she pointed to herself as I stood there behind her, and she said, now, tell me something. I said, what? She said, who the devil is that? (laughs) 
See, the outward does change, and the inward can change, but the truth is that you and I continue to see ourselves as a part of a unique and meaningful family. Then finally, just this, brothers and sisters together. I catch myself saying, and some of you have heard me apologize for that language. I hate it when we're glib, but I don't hate it one bit when we're honest. When I say brothers and sisters, or dear brother, or dear sister, what about this, you know? But you know what? I think, listen to me, I think in that simple statement is contained the hope of the race. If we can't love one another, then what have we got left? And if we can't love one another despite the tremendous differences that exist between us, then we have missed the understanding of what it means to practice Christian love because the love of Christ was never given to the deserving. Wasn't then, isn't now. It's given to those who need it most. To us. So we have to act like brothers and sisters. That doesn't mean that we're going to lose our distinctives. I think of that passage of scripture that says in Christ there's neither slave nor free. Excuse me for laughing at this, but for some reason it's funny to me. Greek nor barbarian. (laughs) We have no barbarians in this church, but... uh, Well, no, no barbarians. (laughs) Male, no female. What's that about? What it is, it's about God saying, the family that I create is larger than the old distinctives. Larger than the old distinctions. We're going to continue to have differences. Major, minor, and in between. That's the way the world does something, but... When there is a love that overrides all distinctions and when the bottom line is that however we understand it, somehow or the other, in the midst of all that we are stands Jesus, the Spirit of Christ. Then we've got something special. My sister and I, she died when she was 42 years old after a long struggle with diabetic childhood cancer and then ovarian disease. I was just looking out at my family here in the congregation and at the larger family of this congregation and think of how many of you have walked with us through much of this and how many of you will walk through what is yet to come because God created us for a togetherness that walks through the good, the bad, and the indifferent. But Denise and I had very strong opinions about lots of things. One of them was how to go to school when you went to high school. My opinion was to put her in my 36 Ford with the split fender and the paint falling off. And it ran sometime. And take her to the schoolyard. Her opinion was to drop her off two blocks away and let her walk. (laughs) And if you'd press that point and say, Denise, why is it that you won't ride to school with me in that car? She said, it's not the unwillingness to be identified with you. (laughs) It's the unwillingness to be identified with it. Well, are you with me? That's only about cars and school. Or maybe more. Hmm? Maybe about a concept of family that endures the test and weather of time and experience. Every now and then we get letters from some of you, and they're always appreciated. Incidentally, they're appreciated when they're angry or ugly. You're entitled to your opinion. Um, And no kidding, we grow from some of that. But when you get a really nice letter every now and then, it means a lot. And I wanted to share this with you. You're going to laugh at this. This is what she wrote. And I hope you won't feel too bad about it, but you see, I never really had a family. She said, I had some people who made me, but they were busy. And they never had a lot of time for me. And every time I asked them for something, they'd give me a check. And what I really wanted was some of them, but, well... I have a family now. I never thought it could be. 
And I never thought it would be in such a funny location on the corner of Glendale and Bailey Avenue. And I never thought so many people would sit in that one place at the same time. But they do. And that what I never thought could be really, really is. Thanks. Gosh. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. God, as we come to the close of this time, we ask you to stay close. And may we feel your closeness, and may we feel attached as not before to the hope that you have in mind when you said there was a time when you were no people, but I'm calling you now to become a people, the body of Christ, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, the family of God. Help us to contribute to that as best we can. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not quite